Did it did it did it. Bam. Bam. Hello. Right then. How loud is that? Oh, that seems very loud. Oh, I think that's very, that's excruciatingly loud. Um, I'll turn that down a bit. Hopefully that's better. Oh. Okay. How are we doing? Let's see. Who have I got to say hello to? Actually, I know who I've got to say hello to first. And I've got to say a Merry Christmas to a friend of mine. So, Merry Christmas, Anna. She's Orthodox Christian, and it's today is Orthodox is Orthodox Christmas. So, Merry Christmas. Um, normally, at this time of year, you and I would be back at work at King's University, and I'd probably be giving you a, uh, giving you a chocolate bar as a, a sort of happy, Merry Christmas. Can't do that this year, so just Merry Christmas over if you're watching. And um, thank you to. My lovely girlfriend who sent me a whole load of iron brew cans so i can still have that so I, 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 i'd run out of iron brew i managed to get some bottles delivered and to make sure i had enough for a proper brew ships and a proper live um my girlfriend decided to add in some cans because as you know it takes more than a full bottle of iron brew to keep this tankard this lovely glass of goodness and joy full for an appropriate amount of time because, as we all know, I basically just drink when it's in front of me. So, hey ho. Right then, Peter Dawson, hello. You are first this evening. <laughs> Is it this early for 6.30? I hope not, considering today invo involves the French, so I have got a bowl full of French fancies as my snack. Sourcing appropriate snacks for the historical content is a critical part of my role as a lecturer, as my students will tell you the amount of times I wander in with the appropriate snack for the occasion. Including whenever I'm talking about the War of 1812, uh, War of 1812 wandering in with a burger. Right then. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Alzaski. Hello, Rick Vasa. Hello, Greg Sotowski. Hello, Brock Payne. Thank you, Brock. As Brock has said, I had this, this conversation with the admins on Discord last night, and we basically decided that it's going to be a no modern politics day. It's going to be a modern politics free day. Although, if we do end up recording a brewship, a bilge pumps tomorrow, got to make sure I get the right one, um, that could be an interesting feature of it. Hello, Carl Van Gasberg. Hello, Ian Carr. Hello, Dunrick Ironhammer. Hello, Seth Thompson. Box tunnel entrances are the proper gauge for you to use? I'm sure they will be. I'm not sure if they've arrived yet. I haven't seen any parcels, and we do operate a policy where the parcels don't get opened for a couple of days after they arrive. So, could be sitting in the garage as we speak. Thank you. Um... Hello, Alistair Crow. Hello, DGV40. Hello, Shane F. Hello, Rebecca Erez Carmier Cat. Hello, Alistair Crow. Last night, shift of the roster. I'm looking forward to getting home and making friends with a nice Tasmanian whiskey. <laughs> ah, well, good luck. I prefer the iron brew, but I don't know if they make iron brew in Tasmania. Probably call it, I don't know. Devil's Brew there, to, after the Tasmanian Devil. Hello, Gordon Collins. Hello, Bart Foster. Hello, I don't think I've seen him before. <laughs> Hello, Richard Arthur. 
Yes, I was debating it with Xplit. Um, Xplit was being its usual fun. It always is. <laughs> Hello, RA4. Hello, Dan Freeman. Hello, Sean Mac. Ooh, I got three admins online. That's good. <laughs> the cans are more environmentally conscious anyway. Um, yeah, but, you know, for the rest of the evening, I do have this. The cans are good stuff. I don't know what it is about it, but the canned iron brew always tastes slightly better than bottled. But it's more difficult to get hold of. And my girlfriend is a absolute queen, empress, at getting hold of it. Um... Peter Dawson, I thought the tri uh, dro would be a trifle obvious. Mm -hmm. Hello, Zachary Gherkin. Hello, Andrew Bend. And, well, hello, everyone. I hope you're well. Right then. Hello, Cahedron. Good luck, Stafford. Ah, thank you. I'm sure they will be. I will check Discord, uh, Stefan. Dan Freeman, I probably won't be managing admin moderate as I need to make food. Mm. <laughs> Good evening, Shumi. Still watching the Brew Shits 31. <laughs> I have to go in 10 minutes, but hi. <laughs> Brew Shits 31. Uh, I'm looking forward to Brew Shits 32. I've got all the stuff prepped for it. Barring one book. One book I needed to arrive hasn't arrived. So I'm going to substitute in something else. Anyway. So. The Battle of Stromboli. And here's the thing. That happened in the, on the 8th of January, 1676. So that's 345 years ago tomorrow. And why is it an interesting battle? Well, someone suggested that we look at the... Hello, I haven't, I've just realised I haven't packed up my tree yet. Poor tree. Um, someone suggested that I needed to... I should look at the destroyers of the Dutch and the admirals they're named for and why not they all get sunk during World War II. And... Whenever someone makes a suggestion on these things, I actually do go and do research. It's the point. I don't just randomly pick the questions which are suggested and put in as patron topics. I go through every single one of the suggestions, and I draw up a pro and con list for it, and I do some research and work out whether I can do anything on that topic, whether I can add anything to it. It's like next week's um, long patrol topic is the white Great White Fleet. And why am I doing that? Because, frankly, Drax is an amazing one. So why am I adding to it? Well, I figure I can add something on the diplomatic and the presence and that sort of side and explaining that because I want to use the Great White Fleet to explain the presence mission and the peacekeeping mission. And, in a way, the policing of the seas mission, as well as policing. And there's all sorts of things I can do with that. So, bear with me here. While going through the Dutch and looking at their admirals, the Battle of Stromboli came up, because it's a really interesting battle. It's one where the Dutch and the Spanish team up to beat up the French. Hey! It's the French Nightmare! It, they're in a Dutch-Spanish sandwich. And it's all because of Louis XIV. So I get to have a lot of fun and make lots of Louis Louis jokes. <laughs> oh, right. So... With that established, let's consider the Battle of Stromboli. Now, pre-battle, what was happening in the year it took place? Well, 
A city, the city of Messina in Sicily, decided to rebel against Spanish rule, because Spain pretty much ruled Sicily at this point. Uh, thanks to various alliances with the kingdoms of Naples. And it is 1674, so it's before you get into the full Napoleonic Wars, Revolutionary Wars, all sorts of thing timeline. But Louis XIV is doing his best to cause trouble, and doesn't he look good? I mean, if any man could look good in a skirt and a wig, it's Louis XIV. I, I am joking, I realise he's not wearing a skirt. But, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, Louis the Fourteenth is one of those gentlemen from history who I just find so funny because you can literally predict what he's going to do the moment he makes any agreement. It's kind of like you don't even need to read the history. You go, so he's made this agreement. Is there small print? Yes, there is small print. Ah, good. Within the last 18 months to two years, he will find, thanks to that small print, justification for ignoring the whole treaty. Yes, he will. How does he do it every single time? Because he sticks small print in every single treaty. Every single time. You sit there and go, why do you allow him to do this? Which one of you other pairs around him doesn't think... This guy sticks in small print. He's a lawyer's wet dream. I'm not going to say, because again, we're not talking about modern politics, so, but I'm not going to say which modern leader this reminds you of, but seriously, there are some good parallels, including the wig. Joe Arnold, manly men used to be so fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> Richard Orbert, going on two days now, waiting for what a warship to download with slow Wi-Fi connection. Knowing I'll be hearing about ships being sunk helps. You will be hearing about ships being sunk, but, you know, it's fun. <sighs> oh... Can I knock the gain bat a bit? I will. I'll knock the gain bat a bit. I don't know why. I kept having to knock the gain up. And that should be slightly better. I've also knocked the volume down a bit. Greetings, Ben Laura. Calvin with the customer. The fourth was stolen. Welcome to Babylon 5. <laughs> uh, actually, the fourth was the Babylon 5 book, and it just has got lost somewhere, and Amazon has actually refunded me the money. And also, I was trying to find my Starfleet Command book from the really old game, Starfleet Command, and I couldn't find it anywhere. But th for those who want to, go, we've gone a bit off topic, we'll talk about the 32nd and Brew Ships 32 coming up on Sunday. It's going to be looking at ship design, and it's going to include the probably shock horror point where I'm going to point out that no, the Enterprise was not the biggest ship in the Federation fleet. Usually, it was a cruiser. And if you remember Starfleet Command, which was my first introduction, really, to the whole pantheon of Starship forces, Enterprise was one of the heavy cruisers, but there was a battleship and a dreadnought above it, which were very capable ships, and actually a battle cruiser as well, above it, which were very capable warships. But they produced them in a lot fewer numbers, and of course they kept them in the core, mainly, because they only came out to fight the battles, because you don't run around the world with your battleship. Not even in space. They're expensive. It goes back to the basic tree of why do we have cruisers? There was a Drac did a very good question the other day on why did you why do you have cruisers? Why don't you just have destroyers and battleships? Well, because battleships are very expensive and keep sailing everywhere in them is not good. It also uses up their fuel, it uses up the mechanics, it makes everything go difficult. So have a cruiser. Almost as impressive, almost as powerful. Just enough to do the job. Pony. Come on, so I think the command tabletop, uh, tabletop tactical game. I had both that and I had the computer game, the first version, as one of my very first computer games. Who acquires the French ships if the Brits are not there? You'll work that out very quickly once we get into the French fleet.
Doc got overexcited and microphone topped out. Take a drink. I should really enjoy get start, start taking part in this bingo game, but I can't listen in. The thing is, from the fact that I heard a shout of bingo from downstairs, I think my mum is listening in and is making a point. Is getting some points. Weren't there? And the Spanish turn up with a larger fleet, and the French withdraw. Then the French send a larger fleet, and they beat up the Spanish at the Battle of Limpari Islands, um, sometimes called the First Battle of Stromboli. It's a really rather interesting battle, which shows why the Battle of Augusta, de Reuter should have probably shot his Spanish commander and taken charge, but we'll get that one to one side. I wonder why you got the spiny circle of doom. The spiny circle of doom. I have no idea why. Very dangerous strong in the uh, uh, currents in the Straits of Messines. Messina. It's an all nice place for them. Uh, Cadron, who sidetracked him this time? I can sidetrack myself. Share. Interesting, the bat when I read the title, Stromboli, it uh, sounds Italian, but it's a battle where the Dutch and the Spanish team up to tell France to stop being a headache. True, and it happens in Italy. it happens off the coast of Italy. I'm sorry you got the spiny circle of doom. I have no idea why. I've got... Ah! I might have an idea why. <laughs> uh, exit Discord. <laughs> Never have Discord running at the same time as you are trying to do a live broadcast. It just takes away from everything. So, as a result, the Spanish then asked the Dutch for help because they're their allies. And whilst they both passionately disavow each other's religion, this is a rather a forerunner of what's going to happen later during the Napoleonic Wars, especially during the Peninsula Campaign, where the Spanish get fed up with being beaten up by another Catholic power and put aside generations, generations upon generations of... The only thing worse than a more uh, than a more was a Protestant, and call the nearest Protestant armed forces they can to come and beat up the French. It's fun times. And for uh, so de Reuter gets sent down, Michel de Reuter, and he's a good guy. He's a very good admiral. A little bit older this one, but um, yeah. The trouble is he sent south with partially manned ships. His fleet looks great in numbers. <gasps> You've got all these ships coming. Whoa, hey! And then you realize they are undermanned to a chronic extent. And when I say undermanned, I mean... Um, uh, uh, there is one story of it which has the Reuter actually teaching sailors how to furl and unfurl the sails himself. In that he doesn't even have an experienced junior officer or, C or NCO he can trust to teach the sailing techniques to, uh, to the personnel on his ship. He doesn't have a free one at the time. They're all busy doing other things. So he gets up in the rigging to teach the landsman he has aboard how to furl and unfurl the sails himself. I'm not sure if this is true, but props to the guy because... At this point, uh, Reuter would have been 69. And he didn't know it, but he was on actually on his last voyage. He would die a little bit later at the Battle of Augusta.
Sicily and Naples are under Habsburg rule. They're sort of Holy Roman Empire sort of at this point. Um, Habsburg Spanish, uh, sort of Habsburg Spanish rule. And Holy Roman Empire, they had been there. They were under Spanish Habsburg rule. And it just passed the extended Spanish Empire. Sure, Mac, really, the religion didn't matter to the Spanish at this point. Funny, it's almost like it's being used as a tool by the elite to get what they want. I should stop, I'm thinking too much. Don't worry, Sean, it, 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 it happens. You, you start to realise these things turn up in history. So, like, um, fun boy, wig boy here. Uh, well, he, he, he signs various decrees at certain points, uh, but um, his senior admiral in this battle, and the admiral who eventually basically beats up everyone for him, and we're talking about later, is a Protestant, a Huguenot Protestant, uh, who hates the Spanish. So he fights for one Catholic king with the honour of beating up another Catholic king. There, are, uh, there is no Italy or German at this time. Uh, uh, German states. Yes. Well, uh, guess what? Prussia's going to be getting involved at some point. Yay! <laughs> Basically, they get a chance to beat up the French. I'm, I'm sorry. People think it's Germany versus France, but no, it's Prussia versus France. Any chance the Prussian part of Germany gets to beat up the French, they will do it. This is why I think the. French have to be very careful in the European Union, because if a Prussian gets in charge, you can guarantee at some point they will revert to their core programming of beating up the French. It's it's like the cyborgs. They're just going to it's just gonna happen. Or the plastic men from Doctor Who. It's just through history, there's this constant. Oh! The French have been beaten up. Who's beaten up? The Prussians. Ah Yes. So, um, the English aren't getting an invite at the moment because they, and the English and British aren't getting invited at the moment because they're under Charles II, who is trying to have peace with France and various other things going on. Plus, he's trying to save money. And um, this is one of the things I do find interesting, okay? The amount of times I find in Wikipedia or various articles, they start talking about the English, as in the fleet will come, of the English fleet. It's the British fleet. It's the Royal Navy. It's the British fleet at this point. Okay? After... Okay. Whilst the Act of Union officially takes place in 1707, And I do realise we are talking about 1676. So we are talking 30... Uh, let's see. 31 years before that? Pretty much you are talking about the British fleet when you're talking about a navy. There isn't much of a Scottish fleet. There hasn't been traditionally... There has been some ships, and they usually were very good ships, but there usually wasn't a large number of them. And you find a large number of Scottish officers are already starting to serve, and a large number of Scottish sailors are already starting to serve in the fleet. It is a Royal Navy. It's a British fleet. So technically, you are correct when you say it's England, because it's Act of Seven. the Act of Union hasn't been passed. But de facto, there's been a civil war, there's been all sorts of things. They're fighting alongside each other. So, now when Doroita arrives off Sicily, there are some terrible, terrible currents. So, uh, Lieutenant General Darmac, uh, Guillaume de Ramas, gets to avoid having to fight Doroita, which is good for him. Uh, and thankfully, luckily for him, by the time the weather cleans up, on the 7th of January, Dunsesk comes in. Uh, Dunsesk comes in to go, um, Dukasin, sorry, comes in to uh, basically go, 
Hello, I'm here. I also have a powerful fleet. And I'm here. Dan Laura, I, I, there, there is a Royal Scots Navy. They had all, to all intents and purposes, the animation was well underway. And it was already under James the Sixth. As I said, I think. If I didn't say that, that's what I was saying. Basically, that whilst there is technically is a Royal Scots Navy, it's not that massive. And by, especially by this time, under the reign of Charles II, we are de facto talking about one navy. Don't worry, the Swedes get involved in this war as well. So, you know, Kehidron, there are lots of people who get involved in the fight. But in car, Battle of Boyne. So, I was not 69, so Irish going on too. Yeah, there's all sorts of fun things happening, but. Ireland's always got stuff going on. It's basically a constant fun of... <sighs> Basic... Uh, and, uh, all sorts of weird politics going on in Ireland this time. It's the joy of history. So, we can uh, meet the Helen of the New Era. How did this war start? Well... Mary Therese de Atrich, of, well, basically Mary of the Trees of Austria, uh, Queen of France, painted roughly in 1660. So, basically, as I said, there is this lovely thing. Louis XIV is the king of... Is it in the small print? And, so here is it. The Treaty of Parines had ended the Franco-Spanish War in 1659 provided for Louis XIV to marry Maria Theresa, the eldest daughter of Philip IV of Spain. And his cousin. Yeah, his cousin. She, as part of this treaty, was required to renounce her right and thus her children or spouses to inherit the Spanish throne to prevent its acquisition by a future French king. But there was small print. The treaty provided for the payment of a substantial dowry to Louis. Which didn't get paid because he asked for so much and the Spanish were bankrupt because, well, the English kept plundering their gold and silver from the Carib from South America and various other places, and the Dutch did the same. It's just, you know, it's terrible times for them. Anyway, carry on. On the death of Philip IV in September 1665, his infant son, Charles II of Spain, was proclaimed king. Now, at this point, it's kind of fun because... You, you, you know, there is all sorts of things going on. And basically, Louis XIV is using the idea that Marina of Austria, who is Philip's second wife and who is, the, uh, who is now regent because she's the mother of of um, Charles the Second, her male relative is the Emperor Leopold of the Holy Roman Empire. Habsburg Empire coming back again. Ooh, Bourbon's worried about this one. And um, yeah, it starts off some fun. Basically, if I read through this. Now, as Marina's nearest male relative would have a claim to inherit the Spanish Empire through his mother, Maria Anna of Spain. And it's presumed, of course, that Marina can't retain, remain as queen if her son dies. So if Charles died childless, 
infant mortality rates being what they were, and plus French possibly assisting in it. Um, yeah. So Louis Louis points out that the uh, dowry hasn't been paid, and her renunci renunciation of the inheritance was therefore invalid. Uh, and then he also finds another obscure law in the Duchies of Bramber and Limburg um, that prioritised the children of the first marriage in the case of inheritance. Now, here's the great thing, okay? Those duchies are really minor titles at this point of the monarch of Spain. But they have all these lovely old rules, which no one's quite sure if they exist or not, and there's lots of different versions running around, and Louis XIV just happens to find a historian who has them and is able to authenticate them with a nice priest and everything. So, of course, it's true. It's, it's, just, it's just brilliant. It's just so much fun. Um, going on. Anyway, back to Louis XIV and his... Love of small print. Thus, the French invade the Spanish Netherlands in 1667. Now, let's ask a thing. So, Louis is claiming the Spanish throne, but instead of invading Spain, he's invading the Spanish Netherlands. Now, why would he be invading the Spanish Netherlands? Well, that could be because he really doesn't like the Dutch. And if he takes the Spanish Netherlands, the next country he can go and work on is the Dutch. And this should normally worry the English, but Charles II is getting paid a handsome amount of money. Mm, so he's being a bit strategically inept. Plus, he possibly presumes that Louis XIV might not quite have realised quite how tough the Dutch are going to be, and quite how much the Swedish are wanting to get involved. Because we, the Swedes like a fight. Although, diplomatically, he has paid them off, like he's paid off the British, um, Louis might find that the Swedish have a more laissez-faire attitude to the letter of the law than he does. Whereas... He likes to practice finding the small print and using that as a justification for breaking the clause. The Swedish tend to just chop your head off. It's more pragmatic and it saves on lawyer fees, which, let's be honest, lawyers are expensive. Swords are cheap. And, okay, so he does quite well there. But on the 31st of July, there's the Peace of Breda in 67, and 1667. And at this point, the Second Anglo-Dutch War is ended. And then the British and the Swedish, who have been fighting each other, um, now decide to fight the French. Basically, they decide you're annoying. You're beating. You're actually. They actually get Charles II gets some strategic sense. The Dutch get alert, and the Swedish go. We can beat up the Dutch for that much money, or we can beat up the French for more. Hmm. We'll beat up the French, then we'll beat up the Dutch later. Come here, France. Louis the Fourteenth is meanwhile going. Where did all these Swedish soldiers come from? Where? There is a giant army of Swedish people coming towards me. I thought we got rid of those in the Viking era. <sighs> it happens. And... Basically, in a classic case of Bismarckian real politic, um... The Spanish form alliance and they protect Spain. The Spanish agree to it and these Protestant powers protect Spain against France to sort them, stop them forming a huge shipper power. 
And in the subsequent Treaty of Alex Chabal, signed by Spain and France on the 2nd of May 1668, um, Louis XIV is allowed to retain certain towns in the Spanish Netherlands, but he had to return three other cities there and the province of Franche Comte to Spain. Franche Comte to Spain. He then starts being a very bad loser. As we know, Louis XIV is a very bad loser, as well as wearing fetching wigs, high heels, and ermine quite a lot of the time. He is also an incredibly sore loser. And basically, he decides that the people that caused his loss were the Dutch. No, 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 he's not going to blame the English. He's not going to blame the Swedish. Now, blaming the English could be expensive because, let's be honest, it's cheaper to pay the English not to fight you and the British not to fight you. We just prefer to be paid not to fight you. We'll go off and fight someone else. And so it's a kind of version of Dane Girl, but we actually do follow it because we can usually find something better to do. And the Swedish... How do I put it? He he basically gives them Russia to go and fight. He he basically tells them to go and wage war on Poland, Russia, most of northern Germany, Prussia. Um, th there are all sorts of this. R the rocking, rollicking Swedish Empire is basically thanks to Louis going go take the rest of the world. Anything? Just keep away from me. Go go have it. Whatever you want, I will recognize. Go go enjoy yourselves. Frolic here. Have weapons here. Have everything. Take it all. Go go have fun. Just don't come at me again. It's just. It's just fun. He's Louis XIV, be Louis XIV. And then in history, he's, people go, Ah, oh, he's this great king. And he's going, He spent a goodly part of his, his, kingly, his kingly reign basically bribing people not to come and beat him up. Yeah, I suppose that's good. If that's a successful king, that's a good thing. Cahedron, so he's acting like the British with the treaties. Who do you think taught the British to do it? Mm. <laughs> Rigid order, anyone know how many lawyers get me killed? Sword needs to replace. And that's uh, got swords are definitely not cheap, but maybe it'll still be cheaper than a lawyer. This was a period when swords were far cheaper than they are today. Joe, worth to mention the Swedes had just a few years before, 1660, ended a large destructive Second Northern War. Its destruction of Polish infrastructure came compared to 30 years' war in Germany. Oh, yes, the Swedes were a rollicking, rocking empire, as I do, I'm trying to point out here. That's called the British plan. The Dutch stole our ships, so we'll uh, t let the French take them off the Dutch and then make it some, lesson, some reason to declare war against the French to get them back. <laughs> yeah, possible. Uh, Rob Payne, isn't this also the result of Russia getting its first half competent um, czar? Yeah, to an extent, they are getting a competent czar at this point. What I have to say I find really interesting, for a wife he launched a massive war based on her claim to a throne. He only actually has one painting of him with her. And it's an Alamy stock photo is what I could find, and that's just extortionate, so that's not here. So here is the Franco-Dutch War. What's going on while um, people are beating each other up? And basically, as you can see from this lovely picture, Nick from Wikipedia. I do admit when I nick from Wikipedia. Um, the French 
basically, and their plan was to go through hmm, certain parts of the Spanish Netherlands, certain parts of certainly of modern Belgium, and into Cologne, and then from Cologne to the United uh, to uh, take out the Dutch. It's a it's a fun thing, and you know they they're having a fun time. They do quite well. Uh, the Franco-Dutch War is possibly how do I put this politely? It's one of those wars. It lasts for six years, which is not too bad. As wars go, at this point they can rattle on for longer and longer. There is even the, um, how do I put this, the Scanian War, which takes place 1675 to 79, is also part of it, uh, because, well, again, French money gets involved, we, but we won't get into the Scanian War, uh, war too much. Uh, 1672 is... A good time is probably the high point for the French tax, and that is really where things start to start to go wrong. Because the French do really well up to a point, and then they start to lose because and don't take this the wrong way. There is one thing which Louis the Fourteenth is incredibly bad at and to be honest that is a structural problem for france at this time it will be a structural problem for france pretty much and their underlying weakness right up until basically napoleon and even napoleon has to deal with it logistics and infrastructure yes france is big and unlike Britain, you can't make up for the fact that um, you don't have many roads by just sailing round it, because that's the British advantage for industrialization. You can sail all round it. There is a reason why British industrialization either happens on big rivers or not far from the sea. Yes, the roads are being developed at that time. And then comes along the railways later and various other things, which are lovely to help with the industrialization. But there is a reason why Britain is able to develop as a coherent economy as it does. It is thanks to the fact it's an island. It allows you to move goods around it. Hi, Earthborn, though. And... Steve Mankiewicz. Cool, I think I'll wargame this one. I think you, you'll enjoy wargaming it. It's a good one to wargame. Um, when did Cassini shrink France? Uh, hmm... A, a, a little bit later. A little bit later. Hello, Cosidrasinus. In car, 1672 Dutch map is most of present day Holland and Belgium. Yes. Basically, you uh, usually I say if it's if you were the Spanish Netherlands, the broadest part of you became Belgium, and the United Provinces became the Dutch, broadly speaking. And there is even a part of the Spanish Netherlands which became Luxembourg. Don't forget the rolls of canals and allowing for goods to be moved to and fro. Oh, yes. We added that artificial waterways. The other thing the British added. Because it was found we didn't have enough water. Only Britain. Only Britain. So, this is what's going on. This is what it's part of. It's part of the Franco-Dutch War. It's started by this gentleman, Louis XIV. 
because he thinks he hasn't got enough royalties already, and he wants to be even more royal, so he's trying to get Spain. And he's getting Spain thanks to his wife, because they hadn't paid the full dowry, um, even though she knew out a claim upon marrying him. How that invalidates a thing sworn to God, I'm not sure, but apparently it did to him. And so he's invading, to get Spain, he's invading, Spani invaded the Spanish Netherlands. That failed. So now he's avoiding the Spanish Netherlands <sighs> and is going through there and parts of Prussia, I think. Oh, maybe not. Maybe it's the other one. Uh, to get to the United States, uh, United Provinces, and is fighting everyone along the way. See, my guys, so please talk more of the French lack of infrastructure. Uh, yeah, they had lots of issues with their infrastructure. There is the fact that, uh, let's be honest, here is the thing. When we talk about the issues with the French pre-dreadnoughts and the things which come later, most of them come from them being built in yards which are wildly separate and where they can't enforce real standardization between them. Whereas when you look at the British warships, they might be built in different yards. But broadly speaking, you can move from one ship in the class to another and know where the things are know how to control the things, and how it should operate. There'll be tweaks. You can tell the difference between a Camelair ship and a, a Portsmouth ship. You can d tell a difference between a Vickers ship and a Devonport ship. But, broadly speaking... There won't be any problem or you know, any retraining required. And the trouble is, in the Age of Sail, when you'd think it would be far less complicated, so they'd be far, they still have issues. And then you get on to the infrastructure for armies. French army really does like to live off the land, and there is a reason for that. Their quartermasters mostly never travel with the army, it seems. They mostly send servants to travel the army and do the actual quartermastering, because the quartermasters for the, uh, the French seem to always be very, very rich, and the amount of food get reached in the army seems to be very, very small. Derp Scott, check out the map. Mm, it, it, it's a technical. It's a technicality. Cajun, it's kind of like going through France to get to Russia. That is. That it is. So, here are two admirals at this battle. We have Michel, Michel de Ruyter and Abraham Dunkersin. Both of them are Protestant. Both of them would probably be actually be quite good friends if they met each other outside of a battle. De Ruyter, as I've already mentioned, is 69 at this time. And Dunkesk is, let's see, sixty-six. They have both spent most of their lives at sea. They are as professional a sailing officers as any nation can provide at this time. Uh, 
Um, that was good. So Maastricht and Liege weren't Spanish Netherlands at this point. The, it was a grey enough area, it would work. Jack, if I remember correctly, in pre-revolutionary France, higher quartermaster ranks were highly valued uh, prey for members of the royal family in her court. Yep. <sighs> Good old corruption. So, let's start off with the less famous of the two. Um, Duncan. I like Ducancine. He's one of the better admirals of the French Navy by a long distance. He takes part in the Battle of Guterres, the Battle of Taranga, the Battle of Barcelona during the Franco-Spanish War. Um, fights for the Danish during... Uh, no, fights for the Swedish, I think, during the Battle of Copenhagen and the Battle of Fenomen um, during the Danish-Swedish War. Uh, Battle of Fenham, Fenham Belt and Battle of Copenhagen High Days. During the Third Dutch War, takes part in the Battle of Sol Bay, uh, takes part in the Battle of Stromboli, the Battle of Augusta, and the Battle of Palermo. Mm. And the War of Reunions carries out the bombardment of Genoa. He starts his career, well, he was the son of a naval officer, and he basically starts his career almost from birth. He's taken out as a boy um, and does early, uh, becomes a sailor, sort of does early years service in merchant service and various things with his father. Um, he becomes a captain in the French Navy in 1635. In 36, he was appointed to Neptune Squadron. In 37, he captured the island of Lerins from the Spanish. And when his father died in conflict with the Spanish, he basically became a one-man vengeance army and, um, and was always, any chance he could to fight the Spanish, he would fight them. When there was no longer a war between the France and Spain, he leaves to join the Royal Swedish Navy. And then he fights Danish at the Battle of Kolberg Heide uh, under King Christian IV and in charge of the frigid, uh, frigate uh, Regina, 30, uh, Regina with 34 guns. Then he returns to French service after that war, um, uh, suppresses a revolt in Bordeaux. <laughs> And in 1650, creates his own at his own expense a squadron, which he uses to blockade the Ronde, forcing that city to surrender. Uh, this earns him promotion in rank to Shift d'Ascard, or Rear Admiral, a castle, a gift on the, the entire Ile of Indre, that Loire Atlantique. And... Then he carries on fighting and getting promoted. He's promoted to Vice Admiral, or Lieutenant General, uh, in 1667. So by this point, he is a Lieutenant General. But he's never really going to get any senior because he is Protestant. And he realized this. Um, in 1684, he retires with poor health officially. Unofficially, the when the Edict of Nantes is... Uh, is uh, revoked in 8, 1685, whilst he was exempted specifically from the prescription banning Protestants from serving in the armed forces of France, uh, or at least his officers, he doesn't serve again, and he dies in Paris in 1688.
And for some reason, I'm not, still not quite sure why, apparently his heart was placed in a silver box and sent to Auburn, Switzerland, after his death. More than a hundred years later, in 1894, the box was discovered and moved to his birthplace in Dieppe. There are various random reasons for why it might have been done, but hey-ho. He's a cool guy. And let's go to... Well, let's answer some questions quickly, because they've come in. Brock Payne. Ducassin uh, always struck me as one of the most professional and competent French fleet commanders of all time, along with Suffren. Uh, definitely. The fact that him and Suffren are both names chosen for the Suffren class, or Barracuda, a uh, Suffren class of um, nuclear submarines, is no surprise to me. That's good. Did Louis XIV pay people to look the other way by any chance? Asking given his previous form. <sighs> He was helpful, let's say. Some people became, got surprisingly senior ranks in France. <laughs> see my, um, see my, from where do you get the info of him? Well, I have to admit, I started off with, and this is going to sound very, very terrible. I started off with the Encyclopedia Britannica, and then I went through, well, various things, and then I went through the list of sources on the Wikipedia page. So whilst I didn't use Wikipedia technically itself, I did what I teach my students to do. If the sources are good enough that they're accepted by Wikipedia, usually they're good enough to use yourself. Just Wikipedia you can't use because it has the problem of not being attributed to a specific author. There's also various other books which I did have a quick look at, and I will, I, I'm being careful in what I'm saying exactly because some of them I did depend upon um, translation by Google Translate. I have a feeling, although I'm not sure about this because it's it, this is from. This is from an article in an Ariz in a Phoenix, Arizona newspaper, the thing about the heart. And it says the reason it was there in Auburn was because Well, his sons have been banished and placed the hearth in the Church of Auburn, from which had been sent soon. Uh, 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 from which it had been sent uh, to be sent, because Durkacine was the uh, pretty much the only specific admiral, specific officer who he was considered so useful that he was allowed to stay, and he was the only one allowed to stay unmolested in France after the, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which had allowed the Huguenots and Protestants to live in France. So his sons are banished. Now, the reason you can ask, why does he say if his sons are banished? Well, as long as he's in France, I think the thing was he got paid a pension, which he used to pay for his sons to allow them to set up where they went. So, you know, it's an interesting time. My French isn't that great. Hence the use of Google Translate. Mm -hmm. 
When I was 16 or 40, I knew Wikipedia was going to pull a brand coming. Well, it's a classic research technique. If you're not sure about someone, one of the interesting things was I found in the books I've got, they talk a lot about Michel de Ruta. They talk a lot about the British admirals. They talk a lot about other French admirals. But Ducassine doesn't get talked about nearly enough. And I'm presuming that's because the good books about him are written in French. And therefore, I don't have one. But uh, I might have to buy one for my girlfriend and get her to translate it. <laughs> I'll probably be having uh, paying her in um, egg custards for years. Wikipedia doesn't have... Wikipedia gets a bad rap, not from the terms of its technically bad sort of information always. You don't know. And the trouble is because it doesn't have a specific author who you can credit with it and who you can therefore hold to account for it, and it's not listed as authors or editors... That's why you cannot use Wikipedia when writing an academic article. It's because the author isn't listed. It's because there is no author or editor. There's, it's the whole community, which is lovely, but there's no one listed. But the sources are good, usually. So as I said, I teach my students to go to the source list in Wikipedia, and as I did myself, and track down sources. Because the good thing is sources cropped up which were in foreign languages which I would never have looked up, never have found, because I wouldn't have thought to search them. So that's really useful. Original order, Google Translate. Yes, um, I translated the same thing three times. I got two results. That is why I, as I said, was very, very careful about what I was saying. First one. Has the glorious Blackburn Blackburn uh, granted you omnipresence to realize Manly 1640 arrived? Um, yes. Uh, hence I said hello. Let's see, I say hello to, uh, you know, when I spot people, I do. Ah, I don't think I've seen you in a while, or before, so hello. I will reference Wikipedia things, but I do not have to look at the sources and the sources they cite and then separately. But I do love to look at the sources and the sources they cite and then separately read them. Yep. Uh, right. So, the Reuter. The Reuter, as I said, dies in the year we're talking about. He dies... In the next battle, but anyway, it's the Battle of Augusta. He is an, um, one of the most skilled Dutch admirals, definitely in history. He is famous for his things in the Anglo-Dutch War, but in other Dutch other wars, he fought in Eighty Years' War, the Portuguese Restoration War, the First Anglo-Dutch War, the Second Northern War, the Second Anglo-Dutch War, including the raid on Midway, the Third Anglo-Dutch War, the Franco-Dutch War where, of course, he dies. He's awarded the Order of uh, St. Michael, and his son, Engel de Reiter, goes on to become another admiral. <sighs> I am less keen on the son. Mm -hmm. Although, he managed to do quite well. Hmm. The Reuter wasn't a son of an admiral, though, or he was the son, or a son of an able officer. He was the son of a brewery drayman, and he seems to be sent to sea as a Botswain's apprentice at the age of eleven. Pretty much, that would suggest that his parents were worried about their income, and so they thought their son needed to earn uh, to join another profession. And sailing was a fairly successful profession, profession at this time. In 1622, during the 18 years, 80 Years' War, 
against Spain. He fights as a musketeer in the Dutch army under Maurice and Nassau. And then he rejoins the Dutch merchant fleet and works his way up to becoming chief mate before becoming a merchant shipmaster at the age of 30. So you think about this, he's been a master, he's been in charge of ships for 39 years by the time he sat this battle. He has a good career, and he has... <sighs> he has losses, though. He loses his first wife and then he lo in childbirth, and then he loses the daughter she was bearing three weeks later. And he throws himself into his work. The one interesting thing is his first wife is a farmer's daughter. And so... Yes... Not a, uh, probably a love match of some kind. Although it's interesting to work out how he could have got that. And he just keeps working. Working as well. His first real fighting at sea is joining, well, becoming captain of a privateer that was meant to hunt down Dunkirkers, which were, of course, privateers operating from France. And that's where he starts to earn his name as a fighting admiral. <coughs> <coughs> yes. This is the actual thing. There are privateers operating from France, the port of Dunkirk, which are preying on Dutch trade. So the Dutch respond in the classic capitalist may, and let's be honest, the Dutch are proto-capitalist in so, so many ways, by going, right then, these are Frenchmen who make money from hunting down our ships and do it commercially. We will respond by having our own commercial ships, which will hunt down the French, the French ones hunting down our ships. The thing better is then there are some Dunkirkers who specialize in hunting down the ships which are hunting down the, the Dutch ships, which are hunting down the French ships, which are hunting down the Dutch ships. And then there's De Reuter, who then make, comes his name for, uh, makes his name by hunting down the French ships, which are hunting down the Dutch ships, which are hunting down the French ships, which are hunting down the Dutch ships. I kid you not. It's just fun times. <laughs> oh, good lord. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, if I, anyone's wondering where I'm laughing, please do read the live chat, which is currently going on a debate between... The Blackburn Blackburn versus the Catalina as which should be the holy aircraft of the channel. Okay. I'm happy for you all. Slightly confused, but happy for you all. Hmm. Shane F. and Peter Dawson. As I'll always say again on Wikipedia, check the sources. 
it's like I've got one colleague who swears that if certain uh, if the pages on certain things state something is the way it is then do not believe the books believe the pages just find the source which are back to you up on that because it is that accurate um and that colleague is really really fussy about the sources john shay how you said it sounded like you were talking about world war one alliances well <laughs> yeah Welcome to the model of the period. Take care, Brock Payne. Okay, I'm just I'm just skipping beyond the chat and just going to the next one because it's just getting more interesting. So here's the combined fleet. This is the Spanish, uh, the Dutch Spanish one, uh, Province van Utrecht, sixty guns, Verheld, fifty guns, Guada, seventy six guns, Vice Admiral Jan de Haan. I do like that name, Jan de Haan. Uh, Wakan de Boer, Eda, I'm fairly sure it's not named cheese, uh, Kravogogl, and then they have Snows. Now, if you don't know, Snow roughly accords with what the British would call a sloop at this time, or a little sort of, to an extent, a bark, maybe. But um, a, a Snow is a very small, usually... How do I put this politely? Is um, a square rigged vessel with two masts. It will have. Well, a decent snailing rig. It's, it's usually very fast and very cutting, and they're often used for the Dutch to sort of replace frigates as the signal ships and communication ships. I always remember we have this classic joke when bilge pumps were talking about, whenever we're talking about is comms and admirals and people trying to control and micromanage down different levels. And this is at the period where admirals don't really have the flag signaling at this point so they need to re rely on little ships to go sailing in and out of groups to carry messages and if you look at it there are that is the reason there are so many snows and there's also a supply ship and there's some fire ships so it's got some logistics going on second squadron it's a fairly decent force again third squadron and um, I've put that it's Spanish, but let's be honest. Nuestra Senora de Rosio, and I'm not even sure if that's the full freaking name, is the Spanish one. They also have Demersion, which is under Isaac van Richt. And if you do look at these names, some of these names you will see come back up later on in various battles because they get promoted they're a fairly decent group of uh, commanders there is also uh, nicholas versure who's killed during the battle and i it's gonna sound strange but um i'd reckon he's a vice I, i'd reckon he's what we call a commodore at this point there are two sort of three star admirals, vice admiral, lieutenant admirals, depending on which admiralty they belong to, what their title is. But he, to me, I think from his ranking is Commodore Rear Admiral ish. The trouble is, some of the titles don't quite accord with a modern ranking, so I've gone with Vershaw being a sort of Commodore ish rank. Hmm. 
Hello, Nautical Wolf. Hello, Jeff Beeler. Zachary Gherkin, there should be a fairy swordfish cult, especially considering the thing's war spites float plane that the version did. Yeah, that thing practically did a helicopter dive. Roger, what do you get when you cross an elephant on an eagle? I don't want to think. Hippogriff? Hmm. Snow is fairly close to a brig. Yes, well, that's another one you could describe as, but... There are lots of options, but it's... Then it's one of those small ships which you sort of see a lot of, and different navies have different preferences for them. Barks, brigs, snows, sloops. They're going around, and also the main difference between them is often not the layout of the rigging as mu and the layout of the rigging on the sails as much as it is the shit size of the ship. They're also accompanied by a number of Spanish galleys. Because it's fighting in the Mediterranean, so you bring some galleys with you. It's always nice to have some galleys. No need to ignore it. Realistically, that's likely a full third of the Spanish one's name. Yeah, um... Honestly... I think even the Spanish chroniclers at points get fed up with the Spanish names. Because, yes, that could be... Nuestra Sephora de Rosia could well be the name. But... The average Spanish ship, in my experience, has about... When you talk about their full name, is about eight words long. So, yeah... Um, the Ruan, the Ras, Urus, our snows, so is the uh, Tojin and Kift, and the Tergros, the Prince and Wolfen. So there's about two snows attached to each of the squadrons. Jeff, did I, make the, I mean, miss the great Ducassine? No, we'll be talking more about the Ducassine as we go on. Well, I have talked about him, but I'm going to talk more about him in a bit. Belated hello to Jess P. Hello, Jess P. And honest, does the word brigantine have anything to do with the brig as in ship's prison? Mm, yes and no. There are various things where they come from. No sé. Nuestra Senora de Rosio sound like trying to say Jorgueri. I think possibly maybe. Uh, Zrak. I hope I got it right. Mm. Andrew Bond. Good bitch knocked ranks with a rear animal. Uh, with a rear animal. Um, it depends. Again, it's, the admiralty he's part of has another rank in it. So it could be Commodore, it could be rear admiral. And um, so it depends. Uh, I am. Um, I'm tempted to say rear admiral, but as I said, I think I, I'm treating it more as Commodore because that seems to be how he sort of acts, because the other two have flag captains, he doesn't, as I understand it, so that's why I'm, I'm tempted to say Commodore, Andrew, or at least that's what I've been able to find. Who suggested this topic? No one suggested this topic. I added it in because, as I said, someone was talking about Dutch admirals, and it's one of those battles I enjoy talking about, and I looked up, and I went, hmm. Yeah, 
yeah, there's an old. I've included it in, in there, the ones which are. So that you know which are ships of the line and which are snows and which are fire ships. And, you know. They are fun ships. Now, here is the French fleet. Now, the other admiral, I'm fairly sure, is the Marquis de Prilly de Hummeris Shift Asgard. But, there is also Philippe Le Valois, Marquis de Villette Morisse, who spends mo quite a large chunk of the battle ignoring, giving out oars as well from the, sa from the same squadron. So, it's kind of an interesting, uh, it's an interesting time. Uh, then you have the Cops de Ballet, you have the Marquis de Lengeron um, sitting down there. You just... So many... If I was um, Abraham Dureskensin, I'd be crying with that many various people with ranks coming around. He does try and concentrate them in the first two squadrons. And if you want to notice where the Royal Navy is going to be recruiting from in a few years, you have Prudent, Parfait, saint Michel, Fria, Mignon... Assure, Sage, Sarine, Pompeur, Saint Esprit, Scepter, Eclante, Temeraire, Ambele, Valiant, Apollon, Grand, Sans Paril, Aquilion, Magnifique. Yeah. Work out which of those names ends up at some point getting captured by the Royal Navy. <laughs> oh. A fairly decent fleet. Uh, the French one, you would have to argue, is slightly on the heavier side. In terms of average firepower and total guns. But remember, they are escorting a convoy. They are escorting a convoy. So they have that against them. Durangama. So the Dutch were fighting the RN Reserve Squadron. More would be in time to the RN Reserve Squadron, yes. <laughs> um, Lord, well, by recruiting, do you mean press fleet, perhaps with a few press gangs aboard? Pretty much. At least with French nouns, you can often guess what they mean. Yeah, off, usually. Usually. That's good. Is the French name at this point simply to see the trial department or the Russian royalty? Not quite. It's going to be a few years down, and the Royal Navy is going to have to develop a bit. Remember, not, uh, at this point, honestly, the Dutch Navy is probably the best navy in the world. We've arguably the French Navy being the next one after that, then the Swedish, then probably the Royal Navy, because the Royal Navy just aren't getting the consistent funding. One of those things you have to remember is that not only after the Great Reformation, where James II gets kicked out in favour of William and Mary, Parliament takes over voting funding for the Navy, and it is often a far more consistent paymaster than the monarch ever has been. Because Parliament debates and prevaricates and changes its mind, but they give the money. And the trouble is, once Parliament provides the money, they're then bound to it. So, whereas a monarch can change their mind and go, but I am the king, it's, I'm able to change my mind, and the situation changes, 
Parliament has to pass a law. To change their mind, they have to pass another law. That's a lot of debating and a lot of complexity. So often, they don't. They just let it run out and then pass a new law next year when it's in the next round of naval funding. So, the battle. Now, before I get into the battle, I have to say I'm going to take a quick wander next door. Facilities. Drinking iron brew all day. Back in a second. E. Just remember, kids, drinking four liters of bottle of iron, um, iron brew in a day so you can deal with a plumber and get all your presentation done and all your marking and do editing on a final section of the book is not a good way to keep up consistently living. But it does get you through the day. Just don't do it a lot, often. Hmm. Sure. Also, another great part of it having been a parliament is it a lot easier for a naval officer to get involved than having to become monarch. Oh, that does help. And there's a whole lot of naval officers in the House of Lords and in the House of Commons. Okay, Agent, we need a, a fluffy research assistant to appear so we don't get bored and wandered off. Well,. I was hoping one would pop up at some point tonight, but I'm not sure if they will. It's going to be easier when the office is arranged downstairs. But, you know. When we're downstairs, when I'm downstairs in the garden office, maybe that will work. Hmm. Yeah, I thought you were talking about French Protestant officers joining the Royal Navy after Edict of Nantes. That did happen. A fair number went that way. Some went to the Dutch. Others went to various Italian city states. Some went to the Swedish, and some went all sorts of places. The Russian Navy got a fair number as well. Uh, Deadly Glenn, there was so much iron brew, does it come out? No. Actually, that's one interesting thing. Is no, that, that definitely doesn't happen. Uh, Manny six forty. I shall fetch assistant picks I took yesterday. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Yeah, Dugasin has a lot of experience with Sweden versus the Danes, versus rebel French and Barbary sailors. Yes, Dugasin is pretty much in charge because he can outrank them all, and he has Louis XIV's help. Interesting enough, the next battle, Augusta, there is a different commander on both sides, and it doesn't go quite the way either side would want. Yes, fluffy research assistant and France in the same descendants does make things interesting. 
Richard, the officers themselves felt the road strategy was so bad they had that they left, or was it like a baseball team disbanding and the players got on a different team? Um, prior to the edict of Nantes being repealed, it had been basically there was no war we're fighting, go fight for someone else until we need you again. And it was perfectly common for officers doing this. When the Edict of Nantes is, re Nantes is repealed, then those Protestants can't get promoted. In fact, they are honestly hounded out. They are kicked out of the service. And they could get killed unless they feel like converting. So some of them just changed to become Catholic. But unfortunately, quite a lot of the better ones um, decide they would rather not become Catholic and would rather go away, including Ducassine's sons. Now, that's quite a problem for them, because if you think he was trained by a naval officer and he's comes on to become an admiral, if you think about his sons, they would have been, let's say, admirals in another 10 years after this point, then would have been 20, 30 years of senior Ducassin admirals. So that's the fr when you have the Edict of Nantes repealed, you cannot overstate this. You basically strip out, I would say, a good 50 to 60 percent of the best qualified candidates for admirals for the next 40 years. And that then has a ripple effect onwards. So we talk about the effect of revolutionary France on getting rid of senior French officers. And then Napoleonic Gauls and all these things. And that has an impact on Navy. Well, honestly, you have this impact going back to this Louis XIV repealing the Edict of Nantes. So you have many points along history where France makes a decision for internal political calculus that absolutely mucks up the way navies at this point generate senior officers. Because if you do not have somewhere like Dartmouth, i.e. a naval academy, or Greenwich, or many of the naval academies that are going to train officers up, so you're relying on them being trained at first as midshipmen and lieutenants by the captains, and then growing up, and especially those ones who are going to have personal patronage, those ones who come from or senior officers, children, so we'll get to see early, we'll get to see what high command looks like, we'll get to see what a good commander looks like. You lose it. And every time it happens, you then have to begin again with what you have left. So, it's not just a whoomp, one hit and the French Navy is out for the count. It is many, many times this happens. Hmm. Jermak, a lot of Huguenot army officers went to Prussia and its army. Yep. Edict and Nance. Okay, Edict and Nance. Uh, if you need... I, I will actually quite happily explain that. And I don't usually talk much about the Edict and Nance because, honestly, it's not really naval history. But it is quite important for this discussion if we're having this discussion off it. And that's one of the reasons why I like doing these things. Edict and Nance had been signed in April 1598 by Henry IV of France, and it granted Protestants, Calvinist Protestants, i.e. Huguenots, um, rights in uh, which was essential in, uh, in Catholic France. He gave he did he did this to promote civil uh, unity. It separated civil from religious unity, so allowed basically freedom of conscience to individuals allow people to be protestant and catholic in a catholic country so it's in many ways it's one of the first examples of separation of church and state 
And it's a continuation of the Edict of St. Germain, which had been put forward by Catherine the Medici previously. And it allows France to really be quite, uh, for <sighs> nearly a hundred years, it allows France to be a lot, lot safer and a lot more peaceful by, uh, by basically saying you can't persecute each other because you're, you're Protestant or you're Catholic. You will be treated the same in the eyes of the law, broadly speaking broadly and it puts the french wars of religion to an end however louis the 14th makes a political decision and his political decision basically is he is fighting mostly protestant powers to his north he is worried about his pro he is worried about his protestant subjects being perhaps loyal to them as he's a catholic monarch and more than that, he is trying to look like he is the good Catholic guy so that Spain will stop hitting him in the back. And also so he can take over Italy and probably parts of Austria and other parts of Europe as being the defender of the Catholic faith. And he's gunning for the Holy Roman Empire as well. He's never short of ambition, is Louis XIV. And so he repeals the Edict of Nantes. And he loses an entire generation. I don't think he quite realised when he did it quite how bad it was going to affect him. I think he thought, and that's something to think about at the time, you, you, you wonder if it's his own understanding of religion. Um, he, I think he thought the officers would just go, oh, I don't give a flying hood, I'll just be Catholic now then. And instead, he loses... Uh, some, some regiments lose their entire officer corps and their entire NCO corps. And some of them were his most experienced regiments. His own groups of musketeers and various other things lost huge chunks of their experienced officers. And the navy was gutted. In terms of, I think... A, one estimate I have read is a third of the senior officers. And a third of the captains left. And that's a huge chunk to lose. <sighs> Anos, what training system generates good sailors and captains? Well, the British system does quite well these days. But it depends on the era you're in. The British system did quite well during the War Napoleonic Wars, of turning quite large chunks of landsmen into very competent, competent sailors quite quickly by having a strong core of very competent sailors. Um, but it's quite complicated at, at various times. Death Squad, it's worth bearing in mind this point that most people identify primarily through their origin and their supposed national identity was a long way down the list. Well, yes. Um, Grace Darcy, also Henry IV was Protestant originally. Paris is worth mass. Yeah, pretty much. Henry IV is an interesting guy. And I'd say Louis the Fourteenth is just as just as politically, you know, he doesn't care as much. I'd say in my mind about the religion as it's the politics, and he does a political calculation. And I think short term, it's probably a very successful political calculation. I think long term, it's a terrible one for his forces. And actually, you know, medium term is a good one. Short term, it's terrible because he has to reorganize all these forces, and long term, he loses so much. Uh, 
Huh. See, Murkowski, no wonder the French Navy is like a bad author. The French Navy does okay, but if you think about it, it's just starting to recover itself and get good officers again. And then the, uh, then the revolutionary wars happen and the various other wars happen. So you have people dying and you have people lost and all these things. But at this point, it hasn't happened. So it's the Battle of Stromboli. And this is a cool battle, so I'm going to disappear for a second while I'm talking about it. Dunkin... Dunkasin um, aimed to bring the convoy into Messina intact and to preserve their fleet at a fleet as a fighting force, whilst the Dutch aims were, of course, to prevent the fleet and convoy reaching Messina and to do as much damage to them as possible. Ship numbers on both sides were, pa were, si were similar, but the French fleet had 1,500 guns against the 1,200 for the Dutch. But as we all know from the Battle of Tashima, it's not how many guns you have, it's how you use them. De Reuter managed to hold the weather gauge, but he did not attack on the 7th. He basically was just taking, gauging his enemy. And Ducassine foiled his attack by raining. Oh, some people say it's just Ducassine foiled his attack by remaining out of range, but with the weather gauge. The Reuters should have been able to close if he'd wished to. The during the night, the wind changes direction, and both fleets ended up heading almost south, favouring the French. But it also strengthened overnight, so the Spanish galleys took refuge in the lee of the Lepari Islands. Dunkasin therefore sends the convoy ahead and prepares to attack the Dutch thinking that he can use the advantage of numbers now and the fact that the Spanish galleys aren't there, so he is less worried about a boarding action if he gets caught in a calm state, to his advantage. Now, there are various things which happen in the battle. You have two chef d'escadres, uh, Louis Gabre and Marquis de Philly de Humres. Uh, who are both technically rear admirals to Dunkasin, uh, but as I said, there is another one as well there as well, who's another Marquis who is basically giving out orders because he's a Marquis. About 9 a.m. in the morning, Dunkasin ships steered roughly towards the French fleet. Um, uh, that was ho uh, this unfortunately exposed them to Dutch broadside fire. It's sort of almost and obliquely. It's almost how do I put this? It's almost like what Nelson would do at Trafalgar, but not quite. If that makes sense. Uh, the Reuters van and centre reacted by gradually giving way so that their French opponents could not get close to them and remained at a disadvantage, subject to full Dutch broadsides. And again, the Dutch are making full use of the weather and are actually able to bring their guns to bear. So whilst the French have more guns, they can't fire at anyone at this precise time, whereas the Dutch can blast away merrily. Two of the French ships at the front, the Prilly de Hoyes and the Prudent and Parfait, uh, front, Prilly de Hoyes van, Prudent and Parfait, get blasted a lot and end up falling out of line of battle, which disorders the van and master fire of its ships further and allows Perilia de Humres in the San Michael to basically get blasted by the several French, uh, several Dutch ships because they're no longer protecting him 
and they no longer have to concentrate on anyone else other than him. Dunkasin is wounded, but manages to restore order in the van, and then tries several times to break the, French, the Dutch line with the French van and centre. Although the Reuters' linear formation, his manoeuvring, and the weight of the Dutch broadside do prevent this. Unfortunately for Dukasin, uh, Gabriel's squadron, that's the, his technically commander at the rear, are mishandled and manage to run into each other. And so the French rear as a whole completely fails to close with uh, the hand ships. And because they maintain a they maintain a dis uh, the constant distance between them and Gabriel's force. Actually, the hand squadron ends up, which is the rear of the Dutch, ends up being separated from the Reuters force. The French, though, couldn't exploit this gap because the wind gets lighter. The joy of fighting under sail. And after about six hours of fighting, the two fleets on a parallel course is sailing southwest light breeze, and firing just ceases in the van centre. There's no point. They're blasting away at long range. They're not really managing bashing each other. Three badly damaged Dutch ships get towed by Spanish galleys to Miazzo. And then eventually De Reuter goes to Miazzo as well. The Dutch lose one ship and get 80 killed. The French suffer 400 killed. It is as indecisive as the Reuters battles ever get. And it doesn't, as it doesn't decide anything, it sets the stage up for further battles to take place. Right then, da 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 da. Nice discussion going on of Stalin's purges. Hmm. That's it. Including a full discussion of Trotsky. Right then, so, let's talk about the combo ships, and Anna Monos, um, I didn't delete your messages, I was put you in a timeout for a couple of minutes, because you're now talking about sparking a Chinese civil war, <laughs> and no one wants to go there with nuclear powers at the moment, and that's kind of like, that's modern politics I'm going for, and as we did say at the beginning, no modern politics, sorry. <laughs> Did the conveyed ships to make it to harbour? They did. So the convoy ships got out. Now everything is gone. Uh, it's only for 
five minutes and then they'll be back. <laughs> so the battle of stromboli is one of those interesting battles in that neither side really wins the french lose a lot of damage but they get the convoy through the Dutch only lose a single ship. The Essen from 3rd Squadron sinks the next day. But um, they don't win either. And Ducassini is joined by Delamras with eight ships from Messina the next day. So the Spanish squadron. is then sighted, and Ducassine doesn't wish to fight an action against superior numbers, so takes the convoy round Sicily, and then he brings in to Messina without further, Messina without further fighting. The Dutch-Spanish fleet ends up, apart from those ships which have gone on to Melazo, uh, get sailed to Palermo for repairs, and they they basically it goes into one of those sort of stalemate periods where nothing much is really getting done anywhere. No French ship sunk at all. They're damaged, and very very damaged. I can't seem to remember how to get accents on my ladder. I that's always my trouble. It's like when I'm typing in these generals. Sometimes I have to make it is tempting to copy and paste from an article uh, when they've got the accents in because whenever I try and put the accents in I end up hours hunting through Microsoft words, various symbols going, where are they? There must be shortcut keys but I can never find them never in time the end up consequences of all this not a fight, not battle is the Battle of Augustine, uh, Augusta. And the Battle of Augusta is a very, very nasty affair. There are roughly 27 ships of Spanish and Dutch fleet involved and 29 ships of the French involved. Again, Ducassine is in charge, but technically, and please note I'm going to say technically, Michel de Reuter, Michel de Reuter is not. Technically, the Spanish Admiral de la, Ke de la Herra is in charge. Don Francisco de la Serra. Now, he turns up and... Mm, <sighs> How do I put this politely? Um... He's an idiot, okay? This is the only way you can really describe it, and I'm trying to be polite about the man, really I am, but as an admiral, he is... He should never have been put in charge. Should never have been put in charge. Uh, 
Um, but he's put in charge because it's the Spanish, it's Mediterranean, and the Dutch are technically the junior partner. So technically, he is put in charge. <sighs> and here is what happens at the Battle of Augusta. Uh, Don Francisco de la Caserta decides, after Reuter prods him, to attack Augusta to force the French fleet to leave Messina Harbour. It has the impact required, and the French fleet come out to sea on the 22nd of April 1676. The two fleets meet in the bay of Catania, north of Augusta. De La Cerda rejects the Reuter's suggestion of combining squadrons of Dutch and Spanish ships, and so the Spanish form the combined fleet centre, while the Dutch are squadrons in the van under De Reuter and the rear under Jan de Haan. Not all of the warships of the 29 French ships and the 13 Dutch ships were fit to fight in a line. Some that were still recovering from damage re received in January at the Battle of Stromboli. The battle was largely a uh, fight between the two van squadrons, that is the Dutch under the Reuter and Dunkerseen squadrons in the centre. The, the, the French van under Periel did also get involved, but you know, They're the ones at the sort of the front and it's fighting, but it, the, the center also gets involved in Duncan scene. Um, De La Cerda decided to keep the center at long range from its French counterpart um, because his ships were coarse of gunpowder or because he was a coward or an idiot. We can decide which. The hand squadron stays in line. Some try and move out to engage Gabriel's squadron, but otherwise they keep mostly out of the battle as well because they're not getting in range. This all enabled uh, Dunkerseen center force to join in the attack on the Reuters van squadron. And this enabled the Reuters force, uh, this Reuters squadron, to be engaged on both sides. So they had French ships on both sides attacking them. During the battle, Lees and Lieutenant General Almeres, who had taken command of the French van, the French, uh, the ship Lees, are uh, forced out of line, and Almeres is killed. Towards the end of the day, De Reuter in Entracht attacks Duncan in San Esprit with the intention of boarding. But Tourville Inceptor, aided by Saint Michael, went to their Amal's aid, uh, aid, and basically he ends up getting blasted. De Reuter is able to extract his squadron. With the assistance of Dahan, who, as depending on sources you read, either um, disregards or completely ignores orders from De La Cerda to stay in line, but De La Cerda eventually decides that actually he does need to assist his Dutch allies, and so actually comes out to help the Dutch van disengage from fighting. De Reuter is fatally wounded when a cannibal struck strikes him in the leg and basically takes his leg off and dies a week later in Syracuse.
A month later, after that, the French fleet attacks the Dutch, Span and Dutch and Spanish fleet and a squadron of Spanish galleys at Ankin Palermo Harbour in the Battle of Palermo and destroy two Dutch war warships by gunfire, seven Spanish warships and two galleys, and another Dutch ship by use of fire ships in the enclosed harbour. And De Haan is killed in this battle. Despite, again, this second significant victory, the Spanish actually do manage to retain control of Sicily and get back control of Messina. But... It shouldn't have happened. It was. It's one of those things that if... De La Thera had been uh, <coughs> doing playing cricket and actually engaging as he was supposed to. If you had mixed the squadrons in together, so there was Dutch ships and Spanish ships in in all the squadrons, one wonders if De La Serda would have been so happy to let the Dutch ships take all the fighting and be getting mauled like he was, if there had been Spanish lives involved. Mm, and Brock Payne, would you say, given the Reuters' high reputation this time as a naval commander, that Ducassine does better in this action than his British counterparts in England Dutch War? Yes. Yeah, Dev Squad, Dutch ta tactical victory, but fluffy research assistant strategic victory? Yeah. Vanessa, it sounds like at least three people in charge of various group of ships were any competent. Well, Van der Han was confident, and so Jan der Han was unconfident, and so was Dunkerseen, so was, well, Ameris managed to get himself killed, but I think he was fairly competent. De Reuter was competent. Serde was um, interesting. Caledon, incompetent aristocratic admirals. There have been plenty of competent aristocratic admirals. Do not get me wrong. There are plenty of competent aristocratic admirals in various navies at this time. They are fine. You can be a very good competent aristocratic admiral. Howard of Effingham is a very competent aristocratic admiral. And that's the Battle of Armada. But the Serda is not. He was 69 years old. He dies after losing a leg. You know. Sicily has forever been the graveyard of um, some of our greatest thinkers and people. You know, there's Archimedes died in Syracuse. And there was that oh, quite a famous female writer who died in Sicily. Oh, who was it? I cannot remember. Uh, Cosmos, where is that painting located? Anyone know? That painting um, is in the Dutch National Maritime Museum, I think. The Battle of Augusta. Is there another name for this battle? Uh, let me just check out. It's always a good way to find out. There's another name. Also, sometimes known as the Battle of Etna. And the Battle of Stromboli can also be called the Second Battle of Stromboli or the Battle of Alicuri. I get the impression this Deuter is someone who knew what he's doing. Yes, so did the Cassine. Basically, the Reuter is trying to force a battle when the Dutch and Spanish fleet technically has the superiority of numbers and ships which are viable. And he's managing to beat up the French van. But because Lacerda, De La Serda is hanging back, Duncassine could bring up his centre squadron 
and smash into the va the Dutch van and engage them on both sides. So they basically get surrounded. And then somehow the Dutch rear squadron managed to get in front of the Dutch of the Spanish center squadron to go and assist the Dutch van squadron. Van's front. Um, you know, just in case anyone didn't realize that. That's... Mm. This is the uh, Frank, uh, the uh, Franco-Dutch War, I think. So let me just check. Yeah, it's the Franco-Dutch War. Yeah, Franco-Dutch War. Hmm. Grace Elsie, the painting is in Luxembourg. Is in Luxembourg. Is that the Luxembourg? Hmm? It's at Luxembourg Palace in uh, Paris. Ah, I thought it was at the Dutch National Maritime Museum for some reason. Mm. Luxembourg Palace is the seat of the Senate of Republic of Luxembourg. I cannot understand why Luxembourg has ended up with the this painting of the Battle of Augusta. But, you know, I'm always told stranger things happen at sea. Oh, Luxembourg is the seat of the Senate of Republic of... France. Ah. That still makes more sense. Thank you, Greg Sarsky. This is why I will never be an art historian, because I just go, ooh, that's a good picture. I like that. That's good. Look, the men won't follow a man without a title, just the way it is. Nothing can be done and nothing to do with skill. More about rank than skill. Um, yeah, that sounds like we were talking about some of the, uh, some of the, ba all the battles. Right, so, why it matters. Well, odd couple alliances. I would argue the Spanish and the Dutch were definitely a classic odd couple alliance at this parent point, and there have been a few others in history. And the realities of operating an odd couple alliance versus working them together. I'm also got a little linking up for the modern Australian Navy, which you're going to probably enjoy. Right. Duncassine commands the French fleet at this battle. In his honour, nine ships, including an upcoming Barracuda, Suffren class, have been named. The six Barracuda class SSNs are the progenitors of the short fin Barracuda Block 1A attack class SSK. The Iran, Royal Australian Navy, is currently waiting on 14 short fin Barracuda Block 1A attack class submarines to deliver as their, their Collins class replacement. So that is why it matters to the Royal Australian Navy, as there are just four degrees of separation between them and the Battle of Stromboli. It's fun. It's sure, it's being an art appreciator is easy. It is. It's a lot easier. And it doesn't lead you down the road, which ends up with white collar. If you haven't seen that, that program, it was excellent and very funny. The guy who played Peter deserves to be in a lot more television programs. I mean, having your leg carried away by a cannonball is a completely survivable injury today. The cannonball injuries seem to be limited to people detonating old shells they're trying to restore. Um, maybe, but let's be honest. When you're 69 years old and it's in the 1700s, 
uh, in the 1600s or the 17th century, yeah, it doesn't end. It doesn't end. So basically, it's why it matters. It's like all history. If you don't actually pay a full attention to it, it can get away from you. And it can get a long way away from you. What was that, that, that about upside down submarines? It, it's not upside down. It's why does this matter to the Royal Australian Navy? Well, de Cassine commands the French fleet. In his honour, nine ships, including an upcoming Barracuda, Suffering class, have been named. The six Barracuda class SSN are the progenitors of the short fin Barracuda Block 1A attack class submarine SSK. The Royal Australian Navy is currently waiting on 14 short fin Barracuda Block 1A attack class submarines to be delivered to as their Collins class replacement. So, it matters to the Royal Australian Navy because there are just four degrees of separation between them and the Battle of Stromboli. Oh. Richard Otter, being 69 in the 17th century is like being 90 today, right? Uh, I'd say it's more like being 100. Someone should do a special on naval painters and their famous paintings. Well, I'm going to be on Saturday advertising, uh, uh, starting the session for people to propose topics for February's patrons. So um, if you want to put it forward to then, you can, but I will do my assessment of working out whether or not I can actually do it. And if I do it, it will be one of those patrons where I'll go, hello, this is not my area, but I'm going to give it a go because it's pretty fun and interesting. But please bear with me if I make any mistakes. Constance, are there a lot of good naval maritime historians who use multiple languages effectively for this era? Not as many as you'd hope there would be. Ben Laura, is this just to remind Jamie about the summary so annoying? You think I would come up with an entire topic for an entire live just to wind up one of my colleagues from Bill Trump's? You really think I am that conniving? And cruel? Really? Me? Never! I would never do it just to wind up Jamie. And I'm sure you've all listened to this week's episode of Bilge Pumps. Came out yesterday. <laughs> and I'll spray twenty eight. <laughs> that sounds exactly like you. I don't, and here's me. I put in my last Christmas t shirt on today just for you all specially. This is the last one. Of the, I, I, I don't really repeat. I have a few repeat t-shirts, but I don't wear a different... I, it's a Christmas t-shirt. I don't wear the same one twice during the Christmas period. I do have some t-shirts which are repeat, where both my mum and my sister bought the same shirt for me separately. So sometimes you will see a shirt that looks as uh, that is twice, but you'll see the shirt twice, but it won't be the shirt. Um... You know, you're accusing me of this, doing this cruelty to Jamie. It's just terrible. So true, but terrible. Thank you, Osprey28. Thank you. <laughs> now, Scott, talking about famous name paintings, my grandfather was the uh, lead restorer for the Painted Hall in Greenwich in the 50s. Cool. Tell me, I suppose, just to be more funny, two years before the Battle of Stromboli, Leopold I of Austria, also King of Hungary, sent several dozen Hungarian Protestants pastors to slavery in Naples. Hmm. I want one of those shirts. It's a good shirt. That's good. It's past the 5th of January, the 12th day of Christmas. That means that you have to wear that shirt, that shirt for every day until this year's Christmas. 
No. It's, you know... I would call this a sort of winter season shirt. The 26 survivors were freed by Admiral de Reuter on the 11th of February, 1676. Good for de Reuter. <laughs> Should do a line of puns and naval history on t-shirts. That'd be tempting. Definitely. Anyway. Here is something which I always find interesting to talk about when we're talking about the Franco-Dutch Wars. Basically, it's the Dutch waterline. It's their attempt to become British or potentially Australian. Basically, they look at the British and go, Wow, you have all this water around you, and it stops the French being able to invade you. Yes! And the Dutch go, Ooh, we like this idea. The British go, what do you mean you like it? And the French are going, what are you up to? And the Dutch go, let's see what we can do. And the result is this. Now, what you have to remember is they also construct a whole load of these fortified towns, like Naden here. So... At points where you can get around, you have this bear moth of artillery sitting there to go, Hello! Hello! And it just keeps getting fun. You know, it, it, it's one of those scenarios where you're sitting there going, You have a choice. You can go past a lot of heavy artillery, which will blast you, or you can float, in which case you will find a lot of Dutch in small boats and with a lot of mobile artillery waiting for you. It works. You should do a line of puns of naval history on t-shirts. Oh, trust me, I am considering that one. I mean to Narden. If it's for a massacre to happen there, yes. <laughs> I'm liking Ruddly Ridiculous. I'd buy pun shirts. Yeah, there are a few. There are a few options. <clears throat> but no, so this is the thing. This is what's also going on as time. So this is why the Dutch don't have the personnel they need. They don't have the logistics support they need. And <clears throat> it's why you can have mm, people like De La Serda getting charge. Politically. <sighs> you really needed a proper battle between the Reuter and Dunkensin. Dunges. Dunkensin. Um, which were, allowed them to actually properly fight it out. Rather than what you had, which was one battle which was... One was protecting a convoy, and one wasn't really was at the end of its t the logistics tether, so couldn't do anything really properly. And another battle where you have a Spanish a Spaniard in charge who won't really do a proper job. Brock Payne, my wife would kill me if I wore a naval pun t-shirt. I'll take three. Yes, that, that's good. I was asking, what did you say puns? What's the difference between Russia and Prussia? A P. <laughs> yeah, it works. It works. Right then. So, I guess we're now into the questions part of the, of the Battle of Stromboli. I'm going to take us back to um, the fun boy who causes us all. <sighs> no. 
The fun lady who causes this all. <sighs> Marie Theresa. Well, you know, you, you you can't really pick. It's basically it's him using her. It's Louis the Fourteenth being Louis the Fourteenth. Goodness me, this man likes small print. Seriously, every single treaty. It's like if you if you're dealing with Louis the Fourteenth, surely at a certain point you should go. What's in the small print? What is in the small print? Who's better, Trump or De Reuter? Personally, I prefer De Reuter, but Trump's fairly good. But it all depends on how you how you stack your top Trumps. Ben, not a question, but just to remind everyone that dark and stormy, they're amazing. <laughs> Dark rum poured over ginger beer. Goodness gracious me. Okay, then, that's another idea for some merch. Bilge pump top trumps. Top trumps, you mean? Yes. Tempting. Tempting. There are many ideas we could have. I think the first thing that's likely to pop to potentially come out will be mm, potentially some more videos and potentially some other things as well. Mm. It's a fun battle, and it's a fun, it's an interesting thing, as I said, this sort of battle, but... <sighs> It's one of those things which happens, and you sort of go, wow. Now, one of the other things which happened, which was sort of caused an interesting conversation recently, has been this one. Well, we're on the subject of the French Navy. Good old Joffre. Now, just add while we're talking about French and Dutch and various other things. Um, discussions about this have mainly been about, uh, there was one interesting idea which some put, which was, why didn't the French buy a Yorktown design and start operating that? Well, as several other people pointed out, there, and I do have the actual questions in front of me if I want to go get them, there were already the slips, limited slipyards and shipyards they had that could actually do the building were full with battleship production. And as I would point out, the Yorktowns are a good design for the Pacific. They're not a good design for the Mediterranean, no matter how many fighters you start packing on them. They're just not. I would, as and as I said r repeatedly, the Joffre is as pulled or filled with some very interesting ideas. I just wouldn't like to be in them when they're being tried out. And that's part of the trouble. But we will talk more about the remainder of the questions, as said in Brew Ships 32 from the long patrol and the aircraft carriers. And today we'll probably go on till about... 
Hmm. About quarter past. Ten to quarter past nine. So about another 10 to 15 minutes. Vision. Yorktown class would fit in the French Navy name wise just fine. Name wise, maybe, but actual operation wise, Matrain, no. Uh, Dunner Gunnam, would you rather be in a Blackburn Black Men observing a Joffre? No, if I had to be observing a Joffre, I'd like to be doing it from a fairy swordfish at night with a torpedo. Dev Squad, the clock. And interesting doesn't necessarily mean good. Have I ever said interesting meant good? Ron Payne. I get a sense that the Reuter would uh, defeat Duncan Seen in an ultimate showdown because the Reuter tends to have more competent subordinates. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Brock Payne, maybe illustrious class, what a friend just said. Well, if you're looking at the timeline, it's either got to be illustrious or arc royal, if they're going for a British design. An illustrious class would certainly fit the French better. And just a reminder again, happy Christmas. To the Orthodox, to anyone who's watching his Orthodox Christian, I do remember that today is Christmas Day. For those of the Orthodox faith. Vision. A John Adams class carrier would not be a good uh, would not be a good fit for the French Navy. No. No, and it's let's be honest. There is the other design which I am quite worried about in so so many ways. As I explained a couple of times this was interesting. The amount of people though who said that the German Navy didn't want it, didn't want them though, is one thing I found quite interesting with the graphs, but was definitely I'll be getting to this again on Sunday with Brew Ships thirty two. But it's uh it's rather interesting, the number who are basically saying, oh, the admirals didn't want... They had plans for four of them. They wanted them. Now, this wasn't just because other navies had them. They did have an idea. The idea was very simple. If you're going to maximize your surface raiders' capabilities for doing economic warfare, and that was how they, attempt, they were attempting to counterbalance Britain, a carrier is very sensible, as the British were worried about was a carrier could search quite a large area of the sea. It's so one of the interesting things that came up was I mentioned the point that a carrier going out on its own solo would be something the British would be quite happy to deal with. And someone came back to me very rarely with the actual British assessment, which was if the British if the carrier breaks out with a large surface combatant, either a Scharnhorst or Bismarck or Tirpitz or Gatineau's now, or maybe a combination of those, then it'd be far more. Then it'd be very worrying. That is true. There is a difference between it going out solo, which would have been the case of the Royal Navy going, "Woohoo! We've got an unattended carrier. Let's go track it down." To this is a part of a task force, so you then have carrier strike, and you have the firepower of that surface vessel. Now the here the point is, I think, with that would be the big weakness wouldn't have just been the number of aircraft that could carry, and the fact that I have a feeling its system of trolleys and management of aircraft would have seriously slowed down its logistical operation, its organizational operation, its maintenance and repair and recovery of aircraft. But so would have whilst it would have delivered a very good quick launch of air aircraft on the first time, I think over a while it would worn out. The big issue I think you'll come down to is the fact that they don't have any light cruisers. 
Because their destroyers, no matter what you do to them, can't keep up with an Atlantic voyage that the, the Germans would need to do. So the next level above that could provide an escort requirement would be light cruisers. You look at that light cruiser and you go, uh, oh, oh. So any serious task force would have had to be structured around a Bismarck and preferably a Scharnhorst, or, may, or maybe Scharnhorst and Eisenhower with 15-inch guns, or, you know, at least two major capital units, a carrier, and three or four light cruisers to act as escorts. But they didn't have this. They didn't have a full task force. And this is the thing you have to realize when the German Navy, when talking about them, they are building a whole fleet in a piecemeal nature. They have plans for a whole fleet and a whole force. But it's because of the politics they're in and the scenario they're in and the fact that really the Navy is the poor third relation to the Army and the Air Force that they aren't going to get the consistent funding needing to bring, needed to bring this, uh, this force to reality. So this thing, they have all the ideas. They have these wonderful things on paper. They just don't reality. And in many ways, that matches up with this. Because if we go to this battle, the Battle of Thromboli, on paper, the Dutch should win. The Dutch have the better admiral, they have the better ships. But the reality is they don't have enough personnel and they're dependent upon Spanish logistics. Then you have this battle, Augusta, and again, the Dutch should win on paper. But you have De La Serda. Reality tends to not conform with our dreams. So, uh, Stephen Mikowski, uh were 70 gunships about the largest during this period? Yes. Roughly the largest. So what we would call a third rate later on were pretty much the first rates of this period. There were some bigger ships, but you know... Many second volume. Wasn't there an issue of going refusing to supply aircraft from? No. Well, yes, there was at certain points, but actually, the more biggest issue with him was him. It was the Luftwaffe insisting that they had the same air space per aircraft in the hangar as they would have in an airbase, which is why you have an incredibly um, underpopulated hangar for a size of carrier. Oh, please tell me more of a GC's planned aircraft management. Uh, so I never heard of them. Well, the idea was that we're going to be all on trolley. If we go to... Let me try to find this picture. So, if you look very carefully at the picture on the left of the screen, you can see some rails. And the idea was that these lovely metal rails would have trolleys fitted in them, the aircraft would fit on these trolleys, and the trolleys would be accelerated, and that's how they launched the aircraft. What would happen was, when they would land back, they would be go, go down the elevator at the back of the ship, and using cranes in the hangar, we mounted on these trolleys, and then the forward two ele elevators would bring them up into position when they even launch, and they would be their trolleys would they would be moved around on their trolleys in these rails on the deck, launch. Then that would be how it all worked. It's um, it's a lovely idea because it's you know it, it's going to be perfect. It means the aircraft aren't going to slip around in the wind. They're not going to need to be tied down. It's it's brilliant. It's the perfect solution. You're going to have a lot of rails running around your deck, which are going to get rusty. That's just one of the problems. Or you have covers for them, which means you need to take off the covers to move the aircraft. Oh. 
it's a it's a lovely system but also if you consider those tracks also run in the hangar so think about how you're storing your aircraft they've got to be mounted on those tracks to be run through and loaded uh, loaded up on the lifts so they've got to be they go straight down ha craned up put on there are you going to maintain them on the tracks? Have you got space to move them around? How are you going to move the aircraft? Both tracks, they're a perfect solution to just make everything so much more complicated. Versus, we have ties in the deck. Tie it down. Done. It's a very simple, age of sale, or practically, uh, uh, system, but it works. Dev squad are not trying to make they only they might get rusty, but a well placed twenty millimeter shell from a passing buff only means you get to can't launch aircraft. A, a, a three oh three Browning might do that. Shoot me. Uh, looking to make a scale model, I mean one oh nine T one. I take it the German German Navy archives do have plans for planes, as far as I know, and the trolleys. Osprey three. It's sounding more and more like Germany needed to have the carrier in nineteen twenty eight to get an idea of what was actually feasible. Pretty much, that's my thinking. Don't again, is it making it, make it more complicated, German modern? No, it's it's like the French carrier systems. The French carriers have these great ideas, and then you go, that's reality. We want to save weight. Well, actually, having proper tracking cranes in your hangar takes up a lot of weight and a lot of space. It does. So using your lifts seems like a perfect solution. They can lift their craft. The trouble is then you try using the lift for anything and you've got a problem because it's got an aircraft stuck underneath it. So it looks sounds really good when you're not thinking about the actual operation. And it's the same with the tracks. When you're looking at it and thinking, going, right then, what is going to be the best method for ensuring that my aircraft are not damaged in the rough seas, can launch in all weathers? All these things. And they're right. These tracks, they are going to allow them to launch in far more weathers. They're gonna, they are a perfect solution as long as they work. And that's the problem. Merely 16040. I'm guessing you just answered my question. Yeah. Sorry. Literally about last three or five, uh, four or five, uh, three or four minutes. Peter Dawson and Bellora, it might not be Burns Night yet, but honestly, I have already had haggis. But that, I come from a family which drinks iron brew, like it's going out of fashion. So, having haggis already this year is hardly a surprise. Right, so, any last questions? Because I said, I'm going to do till about quarter past nine this evening, and then I'm going to go get my tea. Mainly because I had um, Angus for lunch, and I plan on having something nice for tea as well. Mm. Not a wolf. I keep facepalming when I see them over-engineering things. Just think, how far good enough would have gotten them? Well, you see, again, it's when you start to realise the sheer quantity they tend to try and produce of these over-engineered items, you then realise that they are creating... Uh, how much could they have produced if they produced a slightly less over-engineered item. Uh, Carmen Gasman, it... That's good, no, that's not like. So, common knowledge holds the BF-109 cooler radios are really vulnerable. 
But two radiators could be cut off. Hmm. I'm not sure where that coming out. Um, Osprey 28. It seems like stuff that relies on one or two systems never failing doesn't seem to work well. Stuff that where failure is for lack of better words distributed works much better. Tends to be. I... Yes, the tracks work better and you can trust your sailors. You don't have to worry about anyone getting something wrong once it's loaded in the tracks in the hangar. It's there. It's not going anywhere. Whereas if you've got your aircraft tied down in the hangar, you have to have someone go around and check that they're tied down properly. Even on a modern carrier. Or if they're on the flight deck tied in, you'd have to go around and check that they're tied on properly. It's... Yeah, you have to... It, basically, I would argue that a lot of these systems replace what good petty officers would be doing. <coughs> The MP-18 makes me cringe, Sean Mac. Yes. Yeah, thanks for a great session. Glad you enjoyed it. Ben Laura, my opinion on haggis can best be summed up by my avatar. Uh, I'm quite historically, stereotypically Scottish. I should add that I don't support the... <laughs> yeah, my family and the SMP up in Scotland are really not good friends. Calvin Gasberg. Let's see. Let's read it for one. So common knowledge holds BF-109 cooler radiators were vulnerable, but the two radiators could be cut off. And I read a Soviet report that German fighter usually survived the long burst from the usual 20 mm guns from Russian fighters. So German over-engineering sometimes meant robust and redundant too. Uh, that's true. In fact, German engineering can mean very good, but it also tends to mean maintenance is going to be a hassle. So it's kind of like it's good when it works, but it's getting it to work. That's the problem. Nice, came in during the carry bit. <laughs> Have a good evening. Brought pain, thanks for the good lecture. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, and thank you. I was actually, I've recently seen an article that HS Prince of Wales is a bit leaking in crew quarters engine room. It's very true. In the engine room, it was having issues. Basically, we've gone over this in bilge pumps, but our current strong suspicion, although no one will confirm this, is that. Um, Someone saved some money in the construction, and they're now going to have to pay a large bill to replace uh, repair it. And it's ignoring. Get this: I take methadone to help with pain from previous but broken leg. Insurance just changed to new pharmacy benefits manager. They decided there needs to be bureaucratic paperwork that, in my experience, takes weeks of back pain and back and forth before approval. Now, ooh, that's nice of them. This is why, despite being... It's one of those interesting things when I talk to people and people go, uh, are you in favour of National Health Service and universal health care? Yes, I am. I am. I've admitted before I'm conservative, sort of in my sort of leanings. Um, but, yeah. It's one of those things you do, uh, do because it's good. There are some things you just do. Makes people's lives easier. I don't know. It can also mean the panther needs its entire transmission replaced after 160 kilometers. Yep. <laughs> British order. British, we're allied with France. Who makes our ships now? Uh, that, that was, we, uh, we only allied it with them once we stopped nicking their ships because, frankly, they were terrible. This could have been the French cunning plan. Let's build pre-dreadnoughts so bad the British don't even want to nick them. The British looking at the French ships going, declare war on the Germans. I'm not even sure I like their ships. After the First World War, who wants to capture German ships? Not us. Go on, take them, have them. Was it you or Drac who told that the Hayes may amount to higher maintenance needs for better performance is just an excuse? 
Um, I think both of us have done very various points going over the house, man. Roshane F, can we start nicking friendships again, please? Is there any one of them you really want? Maybe the Horizon class frigates we could find a use for, but any of the rest really we want? Right, I'm going to say have a nice evening, because I can hear someone shouting downstairs that my food is ready. Because my sister's cooking something this evening, so we can all be quite scared. If I'm, if I'm not suffering from very random food poisoning, I will be with you on Sunday to discuss all the things for brew ships. And... We've got a lot of books. Because basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through if you're interested in design of cruisers, if you're interested in design of battleships. So take care, everyone. And thank you, Bail Nora. Thank you, Derp Squad. Thank you, Constant Drowsiness. Thank you, Cahedron. Thank